hopefully you can hear me. Um, well, thanks to the organisers for inviting us to talk. I'd forgotten I'd actually written all that stuff on my bio that I, own, I don't know any of that stuff really. Um, so, uh, yeah, so, so I've been involved in, in data integration in pharma for, say, for about 15 years. And uh, Open Facts is a key step forward, I think, in, in what, we're, what we're trying to do. Um, so I, uh, I understand that uh, there was a kind of quite an interesting evening uh, last night. So I thought we'd get into this gently rather than uh, jump to, uh, straight into chemistry, which I'm going to uh, uh, bore you with later. Um, so actually, just a very simple thing. I just want you to think about, as a society, how far we've come in science and technology in the, uh, in the last 60 years. And to help you do that, um, I've got a few images of what's considered cutting-edge technology uh, back in the 50s. So I was in, intrigued to find in the 50s you could buy a, a mobile phone. Uh, there it is there. Um, that thing actually has longer battery life than my iPhone. But I think we can say we've come on a little bit further than that. Uh, you could be the envy of everybody in your neighbourhood by having the latest and cutting edge of home entertainment, the television remote control that had just come out. And my absolute all-time favourite thing ever, in 1952 you could buy for your children their own home atomic energy lab which came complete with four sources of lethal radiation and was recently voted the most dangerous toy ever. So, so if I was to come to you today and say, you know, we've come on leaps and bounds in our knowledge and our command of science, technology, health in the last 60 years, I mean, what a stupid thing to say. Of course we have, right? That, that's obvious. But not everywhere. And this graph here um, represents uh, how good we are at discovering drugs. And the, the y-axis uh, is efficiency. So it's for every $1 billion we put in, how many new medicines come out of the other, other side. Uh, and you can see that, uh, and it's a log scale and it's inflation adjusted, so I'll move around. And you can see that, oops, in the, uh, in the 50s, uh, if we put in a billion dollars, we ended up with about 30 drugs coming out. Okay, so the equivalent today of a billion dollars, uh, we got about 30 drugs. So I will take that as a pretty decent baseline. But this line only goes in one direction. And you can see that over the, you know, over the period uh, from 1950 to the present day, we are now in a position, for every $1 billion we spend looking for drugs, we get less than one drug coming back. Or, to put it another way, we are at the lowest point ever in our ability to discover drugs. So, you know, I think this is a re really kind of, you know, slightly worrying thing for us all, given we've got an aging population and, uh, and the healthcare costs are, are getting higher. So you might ask, you know, what are the causes? What's going on here? And, and you know, one of the underlying causes is, of course, we're trying to treat more and more complex diseases, cancer, obesity, signs of aging, that kind of thing. Um, but this, uh, this graph here shows you kind of the reasons why drugs fail, why they don't ultimately get to patients. And, and uh, the bottom line really is that we can spend five to seven years working on a drug in the lab, and it'll work brilliantly in a test tube, and it'll work fantastically well in a mouse, but unfortunately, test tubes and mice are not what we're trying to, you know, uh, not our demographic. And when you get through that first period and get this drug into humans, into a clinical trial, you've already spent a lot of money getting there, you've got an expensive clinical trial, uh, you find that many of these drugs uh, fail. And I just want to you to concentrate on these red bars. Um, so the, this graph shows the reasons why drugs fail and then the percentage of drugs that fail for that reason. And... Uh, you can see that about 12, and again another 20 on the other side, of drugs fail because they're harmful. When they get, the first time you get into a human, you don't think they're going to be, you put them into a human and they, they are too harmful to be used. But the biggest single cause of a, what we call attrition is they just don't work. You put them into a human and they don't do anything. And so there's this fundamental lack of knowledge as to what's going to happen with this thing when we put it into a human being that is the cause of that inefficiency. Um, just, to, uh, there we go. just to give you another perspective as well on how things have changed um, over the last um, 30, 40 years, um, in the wake of tragedies like thalidomide that I'm sure you're all aware of, and um, drugs recently such as Vioxx, which had big side effects, yeah. the regulatory agencies are demanding higher and higher assurances that the medicines we make uh, are safe. And I don't think anyone's going to argue with that. But just to show you how things have changed, um, uh, an industry scientist called Derek Lowe looked at the current guidelines from the FDA, and he looked at aspirin. And aspirin is such a weird and wonderful drug. It has so many sort of odd effects that we don't really understand. And what he concluded is, if you discovered aspirin today, there is no way you would get that approved. No way at all. 
And when I say approved, I mean as a prescription medicine. Over the counter in a supermarket, forget it. Completely out of the question. So the regulatory environment, the demands of how safe and how much knowledge we need about the medicines is much, much greater. And it's a, you know, it's a paradox, right? Because you know, here we are in the lowest point of efficiency, yet we're, at, we're in big data. We've got more data than we know what to do with. And it doesn't matter what field you're in, you've probably got a slide deck with a slide like this in it, showing whatever data you care about is going off the roof. And the challenge in the, the sort of background to open facts is make this data try and change the trajectory of that efficiency line. Um, another thing I, I sort of have to mention is people. So you cannot run an industry at that level of inefficiency without consequences. And uh, one of the consequences is that in the last decade, 300,000 people have lost their jobs from the farm industry. I think that's a big, big number. Uh, and what that says is that, you know, kind of, that we've got this, this, this massive data, these massive challenges, the, this aging population with complex diseases, and we have a lot less people than we ever had. And so really, technology is our only hope in this. I apologize, I've got a bit of a cold, so I'm gonna to have to keep drinking, otherwise my voice will, will seize up. Um, so I don't wanna kind of continue the line, the world of depression, but uh, industry was already struggling before big data. So decades of investment in, in sort of bespoke solutions for individual parts of the business. Um, and they used different technologies, but fundamentally, there was no semantics, there was no common vocabularies. So you couldn't ask questions like, show me the composition of teams who work on the synthesis of particular drugs and how those things progressed and what impact that had on safety and sales. <sighs> Impossible. Just too comp the data is just too messy. So industry is struggling with the data within its walls. But then you get to the outside world. The vast expanse of information available on the internet in life science databases uh, and in other places and in here, to continue the analogy, there's going to be grains, you know, pieces of information that are going to be critical to your project if only you could find them, if only you could find them. And that's a massive cliche, okay? You go to any business and say, I work in knowledge management, and, you know, if only you could get at the data better, it would make your business more efficient. And they'll laugh you out of the building. It's just talk. But we actually have cold, hard evidence. So, so this, this study is just one of a number, and it looked at three big ideas that farmer were working on in the 90s. So in the 1990s, every single major farmer was working on the three ideas in this paper. Nobody found a drug. Huge amount of wasted investment. And understanding why these projects failed, the author of this study went back and looked at data that was existing in the literature before, uh, before the project started. And yes, with the benefit of hindsight, that's true, but they were still able to identify sort of cold hard facts that suggested that that was going to be the case. And you could have, you know, and if you'd known that up front, you could have at least have tested for it first rather than kind of getting to the conclusion. So what this says is, you know, the, the data is out there. Um, it's just hard to find. So the, uh, the pharma companies know they have a problem with data and they know have a, that big problem with trying to manage this external expansive data, which is, you know, growing very rapidly. Um, traditionally, what pharma companies have done is done it themselves. They've each downloaded, transformed, mapped, warehoused, whatever, all of this public data. Um, and a few years ago, a bunch of us from different companies got together and, and you know, really agreed that this was inefficient and this was you know, just plumbing. And instead of all working on this separately, what we should do is pull resources, do it once, do it properly, and then use internal people in, in pharma companies to actually mine the data and discover yeah, you know, ideas for drugs. And so that led to this idea of pre-competitive informatics. Um, at the same time, the European Union and the European uh, Pharmaceutical Association were putting together a scheme, um, a framework for public-private collaborations to do... Uh, to tackle big issues in, in drug discovery. Um, efficacy and safety, things you saw earlier, are, are, are areas, uh, as is uh, knowledge management. So Open Facts is a uh, three-year project um, in the IMI knowledge management uh, work stream. And the aim is quite boring, right? And it's probably something that everybody in this room is at least familiar with, if not been involved in. It's make a data integration system, right? So it's not radical news that they want to do that. By the end of the talk, I hope, you know, some exciting stuff does come across. It's not just, uh, you know, not just boring. We're doing some innovative stuff. Um, Three-year project, so we're halfway through. Um, it's got about 20 academic partners. 
Um, and these guys are uh, building the software, providing the data, uh, and leading the sort of semantics. The pharma companies provide use cases, in-kind resources, uh, and, and some data as well. And we'll talk about the role of the small software companies at the end. Um, I appreciate that you know, this audience is diverse and not all in, in, in life sciences. Um, if, if any of you are, this is the data we're working on. It's preclinical, so molecular biology, drugs, uh, the, the action of drugs on targets, and, and their uses as, as, as therapies. Um, and we're not shooting in the dark here. We're not just taking this data and randomly kind of putting it in. What we did at the start of the project was to ask all the pharma companies to tell us what they need to do with this data. So all of the companies wrote down every single business question they could think of that they want to do. And these were collated, ranked, prioritized, and organized. And so this essentially represents everything pharma wants to do with all of this data. And this essentially gives the guide that we have for our project and, and leads what we're going to do. And so if you, if you sort of go to the Open Facts website and you can download various pamphlets, there's all sorts of goals depending on who you are. But these are kind of my four personal uh, top goals. So build a software platform. That's going to be the subject of the rest of the talk. Um, there will be a graphical interface aimed at scientists. So you know, basically to show that we're not just messing around with technology. We actually can build something that scientists can use to answer the questions using uh, semantic technology. Um, I think the product, though, of Open Facts is the API. And our tagline is, we integrate so you don't have to. And, and by you, we mean, yes, scientists and informaticians, but actually software developers. Companies who are building scientific software who want access to high-quality, integrated chemistry and biology, um, particularly with a pharma perspective, who are theoretically their customers. And we hope that people will use our API to build applications uh, on top. And then the final thing for me I think is really important is standards. So in Open Facts, we don't so much mint a single URI unless we absolutely have to. We want to use the software, the models, the ontologies, the vocabularies, the approaches, the things that are out there now that you know, people have invested decades of, of, you know, of in highly skilled intellectual input in building these things. You know, there's no point us reinventing them. We want to show how, if you wire this stuff together, it can really impact on the bottom line of these businesses. And, and, and business is a key word. So, you know, you might ask, well, how does this, you know, how does what you're doing differ from bio to RDF, chem to bio to RDF, linked open data, or other initiatives? And I think it's this, this business angle. Because what we're asking pharma companies to do, Fortune 500 businesses to do, is to stop doing this internally and trust a public-private cloud thing that we're building and change the way they work. And you don't just do that. You need a framework. You need guarantees. You need a lot, you know, a lot to, to do to manage that. I think, for me, the yellow one is the most important. It needs to be sustainable. What we build has to be there next year and the year after. It needs to be stable. It has to be there tomorrow. And it needs to be secure. Whatever the pharma companies do, their queries and everything else has to be completely confidential. And they have to be legally assured that that is the case. So that's the sort of overview. We're building essentially a data integration system for, for, for pharma. So we, we decided to go down the route of semantic technologies um, for, for all the reasons that you guys know, so I won't go through that. Um, and, and what we've created, I think, is a platform based on, on sort of many existing uh, standards. So I'll, I'll take you through the high level what the platform looks like. Many of the different pieces I won't sort of go into now because they're coming up in the rest of the talk. So you know, I'll just sort of skip over a few things. But this is, the, um, uh, this is the platform itself. So let me uh, move where I can actually point. Um, so we, wa we want to integrate data, so we have databases. Um, uh, both public and commercial, we'll come to that later. Um, we, we need them, obviously, in RDF. In many cases, this already exists. Uh, in some cases, it doesn't. So we'll work with the provider uh, of that data, the owner of the data, to create RDF. Um, we have very minimal requirements. We prefer the use of open ontologies for this, and we want it to be valid RDF, and that is about it. We don't sort of make demands on how people do this. Um, we're very lucky in this domain. Most of the stuff is already modeled using pretty well-defined public ontologies, so there's not real work to do there. So we have data in RDF, and we load it into the OpenFacts platform. 
Um, it goes through a chemistry step, which um, I'll explain later. But essentially, we're putting RDF into a triple store. Nothing radical there. Um, we are about halfway through the project. We're about to give our first release. And uh, we're on around uh, uh, 500 million triples. And we're budgeting in the project for, uh, in 2014, to be operating about the 50 billion triple mark. So to make sure that we could operate at that scale, um, we launched an open tender. Uh, for a, a new project partner, a semantic web hosting company, to come on board to guarantee that they could achieve the levels of security, stability, scalability that we required. And we had some fantastic applications, uh, and to cut a long story short, OpenLink were the uh, winning provider. And uh, the production OpenFact system uh, lives on OpenLink's hardware and runs on Virtuoso Professional. So we have uh, a triple store with all of this data in it. Um, on top of that, we use uh, LARC, so the Large Knowledge Collider uh, Workflow software uh, that was developed as part of a Framework 7 project. Again, reusing things that already are out there. Um, LARC does lots of wonderful things on triple stores, as I imagine most of you know. Uh, the main uh, area we use it in, though, is federating in uh, domain-specific services. So, um, for example, chemistry search. If you take a chemical molecule and want to know what the top 10 other chemicals that look most similar to that are, um, you have to do that on the fly. There has to be an algorithmic calculation. And so we have a web service that provides that. And so obviously in, in Sparkle, we can write, you know, question mark compound, has similar compound or whatever. Lark will recognize that, realize it needs to go and call a web service to get the data, goes and gets the data, folds it into the rest of your, your query. Um, we have two other... Uh, other modules we fold in at this point as well. Identity man identifier management we'll talk about next. Um, and identity resolution. So this is essentially text to URI. So actually you can write a query which is just in quotes aspirin has a particular property. Um, what will happen is this will be recognized and it will go off and find a URI for aspirin and then continue the, uh, the query. Um, we don't provide a Sparkle endpoint. We actually use uh, Link Data API to provide uh, access to the, to the information. So we identify the operations that people want to perform uh, on this data, uh, the input and output parameters. We get that Sparkle query, uh, we, we, uh, we optimize it, and we uh, deploy it through the Link Data API specification, which is a really nice spec for giving very developer-friendly access to, uh, to semantic uh, data. Uh, and then our, our developers uh, take that linked data API, mostly through the JSON um, version, actually, and build applications on top. So that's the, that's the kind of overview of the technology. So um, again, I don't know how many of you are familiar with, uh, with life science data. Um, but if you are, uh, you'll know the sort of explosion of identifiers that we have to deal with in, in this domain. So here's a database called ChemSpider, which tells us about aspirin. And you can see that it gives aspirin uh, the identifier 2157. So, so that's aspirin's ID. Um, ChemSpider very helpfully also connects us to other databases that know about aspirin. And so all of these things on the left are the different databases. And all of these things are individual IDs for aspirin in those databases. As are all of these, all of these, all of these, and all of these. So you can see the just insanity that we have uh, of proliferation of IDs for theoretically the same thing. And it's the same in biology, and chem uh, in biology as well. So actually, if we get to uh, you know, the, the fundamentals of data integration, we have two uh, databases on aspirin that use different URIs, right? different identifiers to talk about aspirin. Then we want, there's some properties here and some properties here, and we want to present them both together to the user or what have you. And it's actually a miracle in life sciences if two databases use the same ID. I kind of, it's very rare you even see it. So what we normally would do if we're doing this kind of quickly is we just throw in a bucket load of same as links, right? We know, we, we know, and we have this mass explosion of identifiers in life sciences, but one of the things we do have is a good ability to generate the mappings. They either exist, they can be derived, or we can compute them. So although we have lots of IDs, creating cross-references between these things, for me, is not a bottleneck. There are gaps, but it's not a bottleneck. It more comes into the management of this. So this, you know, this kind of works, right? You know, database one aspirin is the same as database two ASA, right? And you join the data and that all works. The problem though comes in when you try and manage this stuff. So, so you know, you've got these you know, massive same as links. Who's saying this? Where are they all coming from? You know, what is the provenance? This is what the users want to know. How did you join that data? Why did you join that data? Um, conflicting authorities. So when, when we are at Pfizer, uh, you can create uh, link sets which describe the relationship between a gene in a human and a gene in a mouse. 
we completely disagreed with the main public uh, system that did that. So we had a completely different set of same as links in that domain. How do you deal with that? Remember, we've got an open system that's going to support both the public domain and multiple pharma companies. You need to support those authorities. Um, and just generally managing this stuff, updating it, making sure you delete all the old stuff, remember what you've put in there, it's an absolute pain. And of course, you've got to remember about transitivity and you, you know, A to, A to B to C to D and you end up joining two completely different things. That's always a problem. So for me, this is enough for us to want to manage the cross-references between databases uh, in this system much better. And this is sort of a fundamental thing we have to do in this space. This is what we're trying to do. But there's a, st a much more kind of fundamental underlying question that, that you know, we need to look at. And that's what does the same even mean in this domain? So I want to illustrate this with a few chemistry examples. So for those of you who um, uh, drank a lot last night, I hope that uh, this is not too much chemistry. Um, but I'll try and keep it light. Um, so this is a drug called Gleevec. Um, Gleevec is one of the success stories from the sort of last decade of, of drug research. It's a very potent anti-cancer medication. And, and Gleevec is its trade name. It's a chemical name is imatinib mesylate. There we are there, imatinib mesylate. And this long bit here, this long molecule, is the imatinib. And that is the thing that kills the cancer. That is the thing that a lot of people spent a lot of years developing. This little piece here is the mesylate, and it's called a salt. And for the purposes of this discussion, its role is really just to make this stable. While this is sitting in your medicine cabinet, it stops this going off. When you take a tablet of Gleevec, this disappears, is irrelevant, and it's this thing that goes around and kills the cancer. Right? But Gleevec is imatinib mesylate. That is what it is. I think you can probably see where this is going. Actually, you can do this, can't I? So uh, we see that as human beings. A computer sees this. We can encode this chemical structure as what's known as an SD file, and that's a computer representation. And there's a one-to-one -one correlation between these. These are unwieldy. They're a bit of a nightmare. To, you know, they're, they're sort of the raw data, but kind of generally working with them is a pain. So we've got a really nice hashing algorithm, which takes this and computes a really short um, string, which is really nice to, to work with. And so in semantic systems or non-semantic systems, it doesn't matter. When people make, make databases of chemical structures, they'll normally compute what's called this inchy key. And remember, this is a one, there's a one-to-one -one relationship between all of these. So you, you delete that hydrogen, this changes. You remove that sulfur, this changes. So what you can do is if you've got a database of molecules, if you have a, a new molecule coming in, you can compute its key. And if it is a literal string match, you've got the, set, you've got the molecule already in your database. If it doesn't match, you've got a different molecule. So what we're going to do is ask three of the major public chemistry database, what databases what Gleevec is. Now, we all know Gleevec is a matinid mesylate, okay? but we're going to ask these databases. Oops, sorry. So the first one, uh, ChemSpider, it's a bit hard to see, but, oops, but ChemSpider tells us that Gleevec is a matinid mesylate. Okay? So exactly what we thought. So we're not going to argue with ChemSpider. DrugBank, a major public source of drug information, tells us that Gleevec is imatinib. There's no mesylate here. So in DrugBank's world, Gleevec is imatinib. It tells us there is a synonym called imatinib mesylate. Okay, so it's a slightly different view on what Gleevec is. PubChem hedges its bets. It says Gleevec is imatinib, and it is imatinib mesylate. You know, so it doesn't want to upset anybody. So the, the issue here is not sort of so much who's right or wrong. It's not that fundamentally drug bank has some kind of view on this. It's just humans. You know, when you get human, they just sort of thought, ah, this salt bit doesn't do anything, and it kind of annoys people to have it there, and really it's this thing that does the, the work, so we won't put it on. And I know, being involved in drug discovery, that it's perfectly fine to integrate data on these two molecules, even though fundamentally they are different. But you have to take a position when you build a system, right? So this is a system that exists on the internet right now. And these guys have taken a position that a drug is defined by its chemical structure, right? It's a fairly sensible thing to do. But of course, the structures of this chem spider and the drug bank things are different. They've got different atoms in. So in their strict view of the world, they are different molecules. And you get this. Now, that, this really annoys users. But more importantly, it reduces trust. When a scientist comes to this and sees something like that, they do not trust the system. So taking this very strict approach, which is sort of something you might want to do, you know, can, can very much get you in, 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 a, in a bad position. So you might say, ah, ha, ha, these have got the same name, so we could integrate them on the name, right? That's something we could do. Can't do that. 
Um, in chemistry, names, textual synonyms for, for molecules is atrocious. It's an absolute nightmare. Here's a, uh, another public database where we've searched for a drug called neomycin. I'm going to probably fall over, kind of coming back and forth with this. Um, so we typed in neomycin, and it's told us that this is neomycin, as is this, and as is that. And you don't need to be a chemist to know that that, that, and that are completely different things. I have no idea what these two things are. That's, that's neomycin. So you can't do it on names. You can't use labels to do this. So you'll say, ah, 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 but you, that, salt, that was that little salt bit. That was the only difference, right? So let's just get rid of that. You said it doesn't do anything. It goes away. And it's really the parent molecule that, that makes a difference, right? So let's integrate on those. So here's an example. Um, this, is the, this is the parent molecule. These are two variants. This is called a citrate salt, same thing. This is called a nitrate salt. But this and this and this, they're all the same thing, right? So in that, according to the get rid of the salts thing, we just get rid of this little bit, this little bit, and then we say these are the same. Not the case. So in this thing on the right is Viagra. This thing on the left is an experimental drug called NCX911, which, believe me, you do not want to take. And the, um, the, the bottom line here is that, the, in this case, this little uh, nitrate thing here completely changes the way this works. Okay? So in this case, this just disappears. In this case, it really changes. So if you went down the, oh, get rid of the salt part, you would be integrating this data very incorrectly. Okay? And I think this is the, the fundamental problem we have with integration in chemistry, that there is no one rule. There is no one approach that you can take. But traditional systems are forced to make one decision. They go down the line that you saw earlier, where someone takes this approach, uh, or they go down the line of integrating these, which, to, which is going to work for the Gleevec example, but be wrong in this instance. So it was very clear when we do open facts um, that we had to sort of, you know, adhere to, to this thing of intelligent information integration. So, a, a, you know, a, a chemist, a drug discovery scientist knows, you know, of these issues, but a computer is dumb. And we need to kind of be more intelligent. We can join IDs together. That's not a problem, right? What we need to do is more, be more intelligent about how we do this. And so, in open facts, the equality between um, databases, between these entities which we're trying to join in the databases, has to be dynamic. And what we have is this idea of, depending on the use case, uh, depending on, on what you're trying to do, you've got different relationships between these things. So if you're in a more browsing mode, if you're sort of casting the net wide, and you type in Viagra, and you want to get all the data on Viagra, you might want to be quite relaxed about it. You might want to get all the sort of subtle variations. And bear in mind, I've shown you just a couple of issues. There are 20, 30 different ways that chemical molecules can be misrepresented. So you, know, you might want to cast the net wide and just say, yes, I'm going to get some errors in, but you know, I'll, I'll deal with those. Whereas if you're in an analytical mode, you might want to be very strict. You might want to say, actually, no, let's start super strict and then gradually see what we can connect. So for us in Open Facts, sort of equality between these, the, the entities in these databases, it has to be tunable. For the same data set, but for a different question, you might want to set equality differently. It's definitely domain specific, right? It, it has to be. I don't even know what SCOS close match even means. You know, kind of, I like SCOS, I use it a lot, but close match, it doesn't really give you any indication of the relationship. It's definitely user driven. This is not some techie thing. We're not at the point where we've actually got a slider yet, but that's what it's got to ultimately be. It has to operate at query time. And it's got to be traceable. Whatever you do, whether you agree with me or not, whenever you're producing these, these chains of, 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 of quality, um, it needs to be, um, uh, you, know, you need to show the use of the provenance. They need to understand how you arrived at that position. So, um, this, this is sort of the approach we're taking in Open Facts. So we've got two databases. Um, uh, we've got uh, the ChemSpider one, which talks about Gleevec, and the Drug Bank, which talks about Gleevec. And we know they're slightly different. But we know that essentially they're joined by the same parent molecule. They are both imatinib in, in some way. Uh, the the ChemSpider one happens to have a little bit extra, but its parent molecule, the large important molecule, is imatinib. So they join together. So what we do is we create these link sets. We separate out the data set from the mappings. They're, they're, they're stored in separate name graphs in the triple store. We create these things called link sets. So it's really nice to manage. You can compute them, uh, you know, this kind of thing. And we, um, we create void headers, which store all the metadata about how we derived that, where it came from, who, who, who built it. And what we do is we create a repository of link sets. Okay, so these can be quite simple. You know, the, the you know, um, 
that these things are exactly the same. That's the easy case. You, you know, the parent type thing that, you know, kind of drugs are joined on the parent. Um, things are like enantiomers. So um, uh, chemical molecules have handedness. So my hands are identical. They're just mirror images of each other. And when you transcribe a, a chemical molecule, which has what's called stereochemistry, um, Copying it from paper into a computer, or actually even processing it through a lot of chemical processing software, can completely ruin that thing. And you have a molecule that's like this, and you end up turning it into a molecule that's like that. So if you cared about the molecule storosporine, and you wanted to get the data, uh, and things like text mining, for example, cannot. Text mining searches on this word. It doesn't search on these, this plus and minus, which denote the two forms, right? So if you want the text mining data on storosporine, there's no point worrying about which way around it is. Um, if you want all the data, you're better off kind of saying, ignore this, this uh, stereochemistry for now. Just let's say that you know, if it's attached to this or attached to this, it doesn't matter. We want to bring this data in. But this, this property of handedness is the actual cause behind the tragedy of thalidomide. So there are absolute reasons why you never, ever want to mix that data. Again, it fully depends on your use case. And then you can imagine that you know, someone's eaten 22 kilograms of vanilla essence and died. Was that due to the molecule vanillin, which is inside it? And that's the thing that gives vanilla its taste. You know, if you cared about that, you might be caring about stuff that's, that's linked to that. I don't recommend eating a lot of uh, vanilla essence, mind. OK, so, we, um, uh, so what we do in Open Facts is we have these link sets. Uh, we create profiles. So we identify the, you know, kind of, you might be that in a broad uh, search, you kind of want to bring in lots of different things. So we, we say that, you know, kind of all of these sort of the relationships, these predicates, are allowed to stand for equality in a broad search. There could be stricter searches that only allow this sort of parent child, which is a very common thing to do in chemistry. And there'll be kind of, sort of a, a much more strict profile where you say only exact matches are, are allowed. And then, we implement this uh, through, uh, through Lark and, and this plugin identifier module. So let me just walk through. Um, <coughs> we have our, <coughs> sorry, our graph, uh, particular data set that we want um, uh, data on. I'm going to have to stand here. Um, so we want to know for, let's say this is aspirin, this is a URI for aspirin, and we want this log D property. Now, there's actually no triple that satisfies that condition. These CW URIs are not in this graph. We don't need to care. Uh, what happens is Lark passes the Sparkle query uh, before execution to the query expander service. And it recognizes that this URI is a chemical. And a chemical is something that we support dynamic expansion of. It then passes this URI to what we know as the identity mapping service, which is this set of link sets. And, and, you know, and passes a particular profile. And the profile is essentially you know, a set of link sets which are valid, a query over link sets which represent equality. And so it returns the fact that these URIs are the same. It says, in, these, in different databases, according to the profile you've given me, I think this, this, and this should be considered the same thing as this. It sends that query back, um, and there we go. Uh, and, and the query expander service rewrites the Sparkle query and says there is some URI that has this property, and it could be the input one, or it could be any of these ones that we think are equal. It then executes that, and you get the data. And this is way beyond my level of expertise, but the, the team at uh, Carol Goebel's group in, uh, in Manchester and Chris Evelo in, uh, in Maastricht who built this, they hard-coded all this with same as and got some benchmarks, and then they tried filter by and union by statements and found this filter by graph mechanism worked and it didn't really give you that much of an issue with performance. It's certainly not going to be the, bo the, the bottleneck we have to deal with with performance. Um, the other trick you can play is, um, because we, we know which graph this is in, we know sort of all the metadata around the graph, uh, we know actually that this, this particular data set doesn't have CW, Kemble, or DB URIs in it anywhere. So the query expander can use that and doesn't even bother putting these in, and that makes it even more efficient. And so for me, this is just this is fantastic because it, it allows us to manage the, these mappings really nicely. It allows us to swap in and out all different versions of mappings and ask what are the consequences if we take this person's mappings, you know, two different authorities, two different pharma companies. It allows us to see what, what those issues are. I mentioned um, the void header. It was on a couple of slides. So uh, again, I'm probably the least qualified person in the room to talk about this, but void is the vocabulary of interlinked data sets and describes metadata around data sets. Um, every data set, whether it be a link set or a proper sort of bona fide data set within OpenFacts, has a void header. And um, uh, there's a group called Derry. You might have heard of them. Um, they've built a, uh, an editor for, for humans. 
to actually edit and, uh, and make link sets. And they, they, you type the stuff in here, and it makes RDF of describing this method. Uh, sorry, uh, the void header that comes here. So we've um, uh, expanded this uh, by adding in much more details around provenance. So one of the issues is that when you take some of this data and you're taking RDF, um, who made the RDF? We've had situations where we take a database called Kemble, version 13. Two different conversions of Kemble 13 exist. And they actually have very sort of subtle differences in them. So it's not just the, um, you know, the, the, the version of the database, it's the version of the RDF. Did you get the database and make the RDF yourself? Did someone else get the database and they made the RDF and you took it from them? Did you then modify it? So we're trying to cope with really encoding this. And as I say, I've been, I've been doing this for over a decade now, and the number one question in data integration is, what version of this database is in your system? You get that all the time. So we, this is an absolute requirement for us. Um, so we've, we've extended the editor to add a lot more stuff around the, the origin of the data, and we code that using the uh, provenance and versioning ontology, and uh, Paul Groth from the group was involved in the W3C Prov working group, and we're folding some of that in uh, as well. It's really good when you've got this level of provenance, right? When you've got provenance around all the data that you've got in an integration system. Um, you can't read this too well, but this thing on the left is the XML result from our API. So someone's called our API and said, well, I want integrated data on a compound. Um, I've, you know, we've got about six or seven compound databases in the system. I've put, I've put in aspirin or whatever, and I want to see all of the data across these systems. And each sort of cluster of data points has this in data set tag which is essentially the dereferenceable URI for the void header. So you can actually get that and actually find out where that set of data points came from. But you can do really nice things with this in the, in the interface. Um, in, uh, there's a, in our, this is just an early version of our interface, but you can see that there's a, um, a sort of a provenance toggle here that someone has switched on. And what happens now is in this data grid, each column is colored compared to, uh, based on the data set it comes from. And this is quite nice for us because it shows that we're doing data integration. Our first three columns are from different databases. Um, but you know, for the user, it shows exactly where we, uh, we obtain these different properties from. And you can actually click and go and, uh, you know, and get them. So again, helping to build trust in the u uh, from the user that you know, we, they know where this data is coming from. Um, that's um, provenance at the, um, at the data set level. We also care about provenance at the individual assertion level. For that, we're using uh, nano publications. Um, so again, there's a sort of conceptual definition of a nano pub, which is a, a short statement of fact. You know, um, Galway is in Ireland, um, and then there's a, an implementation. And, uh, and, and Paul's paper, um, uh, and Andrew and, and Jan, of course, uh, described that as uh, RDF name graphs. So you know, you encode, you know, your fact. There's a series of triples, and then the you know who's saying that and why, uh, and and then some supporting context. And the supporting context is kind of hotly debated. My personal view is it's kind of like tagging in Web two, where you want some higher level things that you know. When I see a, a scientific data set, I want to know what what is it in humans or a test tube. That that without a shadow of a doubt, that's the first thing I want to ask. So you know for high level filtering. But I think there's quite a lot of debate as to what supporting needs to be. So um, one of the ways we're using nano publications in, in a number of different places in the system. Um, one of the places we're using it is, is credit for curation. So I mentioned that um, uh, chemistry synonyms and labels are an absolute nightmare. They're terrible. And so one way you can try and look at this is, um, is through sort of crowdsourced curation. Um, so this is um, uh, from a, a real example that happened in the project. Uh, uh, this, the authoritative database, Kemble, I have to be really careful here because my wife builds this database, so I have to be very careful in how I say this. Um, so the authority had a slight issue uh, in that it used the same synonym to describe two separate, uh, completely different molecules. So bisacodal is this thing, it's not this thing. So in open facts, uh, if you see something like this, you can actually go into Concept Wiki, which is our terminology editor, click the little trash icon, uh, and then mark it as a, as a bad synonym relationship. And that doesn't delete the synonym, it creates a nano publication that asserts that a certain user has said that that synonym is incorrect. And of course, then you overlay that in your interface and, and whatever else. And hopefully, you know, using this, there, there's actually a lot of people out there willing to curate chemistry um, if you only give them the mechanisms to do it. So, so we're hoping that this will help. 
Um, you might be surprised to learn that in public and indeed in some private databases, around 15% of the chemicals that are in these databases cannot exist on the planet Earth. They are completely wrong. They just physically can't exist. Um, and it's due to transcription errors. You know, many of these things are copied from patents or publications by hand. Um, uh, but even, even if you get from the paper to, to a, uh, an electronic structure, as I mentioned before, a lot of the software can mess up on, on the nuances. So again, you know, I, I showed you this sort of salt thing that, that's sort of a big thing. There's about 20, 30 other variations that we have to cope with. A lot of them are very, very subtle indeed, and software can mess it up. So, so what we have is a chemistry validation system, which has got a major series of rules, which will go through these structures and uh, look at uh, what's going wrong in them. And so this is, you know, kind of 20, 30, 40, 50 even uh, different heuristics. Uh, and some of these things are really subtle. Even a non you know, as a non-chemist, you'd never see them. And I've seen publications where people have analysed public data and made conclusions about particular molecules where those molecules are fundamentally incorrect in that source database. And so we are going to process around the 2 million compounds that are in OpenFacts through this system. And all of this validation data will be uh, made available as nanopublications, and you'll be able to, 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 to use that. And I think it will really help non-chemists in interpreting this data. It also helps the Royal Society of Chemistry who do this um, you know, to gain credit for putting you know, what's going to be 2 million times, I think it's about say, you know, 80, 100 triples um, into the public domain. We've also uh, used the, um, uh, uh, implemented the QUDT, so the Quantities, uni Units, Dimensions and Types ontology, um, which is a really rich ontology for describing uh, the units around quantitative data. So, so OpenFacts is really based around quantitative data. And if we look at the, um, the major database that we're using, which is, which is the Campbell database, um, there are over 5,000 different types of assay. So, you know, number of fleas dead would be an assay. Number of fleas dead per hour would be another assay. Number of fleas dead per hour per dog would be another assay. You know, so you've got this. I mean, there's an assay in there called death. I don't know what of, but, you know, I don't, and I don't know whether you want it to be high or low, but, the, you know, the, the, those things are in there. So we have this mass. This is a highly curated database. We have over 5,000 different types of experiment. Each experiment, though, if we take IC50, which is a very common way to measure the activity of a drug, has 46 different types of units. Some of them are list listed there. And they vary between, you know, kind of very different measures to diff just different representations of the same thing, synonyms almost. You know, micrograms, mil to the minus one, micrograms per mil. Um, it's interesting. So Kemble has been in RDF form on the semantic web for about three or four years. And all of this was encoded as literals. And I'm not sure what anyone could really have done with that data. Because unless you can interconvert, remember, each one of these assays is a different assay that has all of these units. Unless you can bring this stuff together, I don't see how you can gain a full picture. Certainly you know, not, you know, not a picture that you couldn't just get from going to the, the, the website. So we've worked with the, uh, the folks at Maastricht who originally did the Kemble RDF conversion and the Kemble group to implement QUDT within, within this. And I think it's going to kind of really enhance the way that this data can be used. Uh, we haven't yet done the kind of cool reasoning thing where you can interconvert between different measures, um, but I know the semantic web people are very excited about, about doing that. Okay, we're nearly done. Um, so, coming back to how this differs from some of the other efforts, um, I spoke to uh, one of the leaders from a, a, a very um, open um, uh, data, life science data integration project. And I said, uh, how do you deal with licensing of the data? And he just smiled at me and walked off. Um, because, you know, data is open, or, you know, but just how open is it? So in the, um, in, in the V2 editor that we've, we've cannibalized from the, 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 the Derry uh, version, um, we have an extended licensing section. But it's not just kind of connecting to a URI for a CC by SA or whatever license. That, that's good. I mean, we have to, you know, we work with um, pharma companies, right? Pharma companies, you might be surprised to know, are scared of being sued. They really don't want to get sued. And using data where they're not supposed to be is something that scares the pants off them. So we have to encode all the licensing information in the void header so that when they use this data, they can be very clear on what they're, what they're doing. We have to do this, unlike some of the other efforts who kind of you know, it's not really a requirement, so they don't have to do this. 
But as I say, it's not just as simple as a URI for a specific uh, license. Um, these, are the, these are the full licenses behind Drug Bank and a thing called OMIM. That's it. And it says it's freely available unless you're commercial, then it isn't. And we're a sort of public, private, pharma, EU, want to make some money in a non profity way thing. Not quite sure where we fit into that. So we have to negotiate with these providers. We have to work with them to understand what the licensing restrictions are for us, and then we're going to have to encode that in the void header so that anybody who uses the open facts, and remember this could be professional software developers who want to use the API, are completely happy with the terms and conditions around the system. So, so licensing is a major part of what we do. Um, I mentioned this before, uh, again, a differentiator with other projects, we have to put in uh, commercial data. So data that uh, you have to pay for and is restricted. And this has to live in the exact same endpoint as all of the public data. There will be one endpoint at openfacts.org. Uh, and so uh, we will uh, obviously work with these guys and convert into RDF, create the void headers which are going to describe the restrictions, etc. And then we'll be working with OpenLink on their graph level authentication so that when you actually go to the system, when you do a query, uh, if you're not entitled to see those triples, you don't see them. That's going to be uh, sort of towards the end of, uh, of 2013. OK, um, last couple of slides you'd be pleased to know. Um, so, so, so I've come back to kind of more general stuff now. Um, Sustainability. So I mentioned the role of, sort of these. We've got some small software companies uh, in the project. Um, you know, this this is intended to be a, a shared resource that um, pharma and uh, a non-profit can can work together on and using sort of similar um, uh, technology and standards. Um, and we need to fund it. You know, for this to exist, it needs to exist past the 2014 point where the original funding runs out. So obviously you can go to industry, you know, you can and, and ask for money from industry, which is uh, an interesting thing to do. Uh, we can apply for grants. Uh, we can look for collaborations with with folks, maybe some some folks here. Um, but we have this API. We've done all of this work on you know all this complex chemistry integration, all of this data uh, in pharmacology that we have, and we think that's of use to people who work in this domain and, and want to sell. Um, uh, software to pharma. And that's actually why some of the pharma companies are in here. They want this. They want a rich ecosystem of software vendors, but for these vendors to use the same language, to use the same standards. So the pharma companies are in here to sort of promote this. So they kind of, you know, this is why the software companies are part of the project. They come in at the API level. They do not care about the semantics. Some of them are more interested than others, but they just want an API. They want an API that you put in a compound and it gives you this. And this is why, you know, we, we spend a lot of time building the API. Uh, so we hope that, again, you know, we have a, a, an active program of engagement with these guys, and we hope that we'll, you know, over, over the next few years, build this ecosystem of applications. So to kickstart the project, we got these uh, three or four software companies in to build some apps. There actually are real applications that they actually are going to try and sell uh, based on the API. So it should be interesting. And, and uh, if anyone's in this domain or interested, um, I can give you more details um, after, after the talk. So finally, uh, we're aware that we're part of a wider community. Um, so you know, we have a lot of partners um, uh, you know, across the European universities. Um, but equally, you know, there's a lot of people who, who we don't know. Um, so we have a partnership program. Um, and, and this sort of is, at, I guess, two main levels. One is the associate partners. So if you're just generally interested, um, you think the technology might be interesting, and you think, you know, I'm not talking complete rubbish and it might actually be worthwhile, um, you can join as an associate partner. And all you get is, you know, you basically just sort of become friends of the project. You get to, you know, come to a few telecons, maybe present your stuff to, to us as well, and really sort of just some interaction, get early beaters, that kind of thing. Um, if there's a more concrete proposal, if there's a specific piece of work, you're consuming our resources or we could use your technology, um, we can enter into a development partnership. And that requires us to sign something to say how we're going to fund it, who's going to do the work, when it's going to be delivered. We've got a few of those ongoing now and that's a really nice way to kind of to, to, to get to bridge. So um, you'll be pleased to know I'm, I'm done. Um, I, I hope that you know, this is... Um, you know, showing you that you know, drug discovery is really changing and uh, we have real you know, challenges ahead. And so this project is designed for, for that environment. Um, I also think that the timing with this technology is good. I mean, you know, we're working with the VU uh, on, on the semantics and Carol Goebel's group and uh, an open link, right? So we've got a pretty 
pretty good team on, on semantics. And yet, we're still finding a lot of things that we have to tweak, a lot of the things that we have to fit. You know, we, we're making changes to Virtuoso to make it work for what we want to do. So the technology is still immature. If we'd have done this four or five years ago, I don't think we would have, you know, we would have been able to do it. So I think the timing is good. Um, the challenge, um, everything I've shown you today, pharma can already do. They can do it using their own internal systems that are based on sort of standard technologies. So in three years, with a team spread over about 12 European countries, uh, with a pile of techie people who don't know the data and a pile of data people who don't know the technology, uh, and then take six months off either side because of getting up and starting up and slowing down, um, in about two years, we have to not only use this new technology to be as good as what's there, we have to better it. And if anyone doesn't think that's a challenge, they can perhaps have my job. Um, and I, you know, I don't want to make light of the funding challenges. You know, I, you know, it's easy to say we've got these different streams. It's a hard, you know, we all know it's hard getting funding. So I just want to acknowledge uh, the, the folks in the, in the, in the consortium. Um, there's obviously a very large consortium. I can't mention everybody, um, but um, you know, a lot of people have contributed to this. In particular, the EBI, um, giving us a lot of data, um, the European Bioinformatics Institute, uh, Lundbeck uh, Pharma Company were fantastic in donating their internal software platform, uh, which forms the basis of our graphical interface. So they donated that. Uh, Maastricht uh, do uh, a lot of the uh, uh, pathways and chemical data and been involved in the identity stuff. Carol's group uh, run the identity and also the void work. Uh, Steve's group in Manchester uh, do the graphical interface. Uh, Enbic, Barron is obviously the, a leader in nanopublications. Uh, Case works on the concept wiki. Uh, Royal Society of Chemistry, or our chemistry engine, do all the chemistry stuff I, I showed. Um, Swiss Institute of Bioinformatics, uh, Christine's our data guru and also um, uh, runs some concept wiki. Uh, the VU, or our semantic lead, uh, Paul Groth, is, uh, is the chief architect on the project, and of course, uh, OpenLink, who have recently joined. And we're also indebted to um, Chem to Bio to RDF for getting us going in the early days. Uh, and with that, I'll, I'll finish, and I hope that was in some way uh, interesting and relevant. Thanks. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, that's it's an excellent question. I mean, the um, uh, one of the things that's difficult on a project like this is to know where to stop. You know, I, I think that for me, um, open facts is kind of open facts 1.0 is a statement of intent. It's you know, can you because I think the, the the it's not so much about the technology; it's more about the philosophy of can you build you know this infrastructure that pharma can get involved in with with the public domain. But to to answer your specific question, um, we're doing a few things. So one thing I didn't mention was um, uh, we're working with um, uh, publishers. Um, to actually create nano publications. Um, so that what will happen is the publisher takes paper, um, identifies salient facts, the, the, the pertinent, creates nano publications, and those go into, into the system. So that's one, one area we're working on. Um, we're sort of, so we're not, we are not a kind of nano publication project, but we are working with you know, folks at na nanopub.org. And, uh, and I know that they are also looking at um, interactions with folks like Dryad and, and Datasite, so that you can actually create, you know, stable URIs for data sets and connect, connect into those. Um, one final thing that I mentioned is we had a project called CECIL, uh, with semantic enrichment of the scientific literature. Um, and this was kind of a, a sort of a precursor to open facts. Um, and this was about sort of federated knowledge. So what it was was, let's say you cared about diabetes and you wanted to know facts about diabetes. Um, it was a semantic interface to allow each publisher to create a server 
that you entered a topic and it returned you back structured data. And that essentially the Cecil engine was a thing that sat in the middle and just brokered to all these individual servers and asked for that data. And that project developed a lot of kind of ideas, standards, philosophies around how you might do something like that. And, and if, for me, if there's an open fact too, I would want to wire that in, particularly the kind of live querying, because you don't want to be databasing all this stuff. You want to be asking the authority. So that's what I'd like to do. So first a comment on one of the screens upstairs. We have a movie running uh, where you can see some of the, you can see the uh, architecture and some of the user interfaces that are running on top of the architecture that he was painting. So that's in the coffee break. Uh, I had a question about your, uh, your community curation. Mm -hmm. right? so, so this was a topic that came up a couple of talks earlier in the week, also sort of crowdsourcing, or, or even not large crowds, but small crowds of specialists that you try to recruit to, uh, to curate your data. And that's also, you, you briefly sketched. Yeah. So how far are you with that? Uh, have you actually begun to engage communities? And, and what is your experience there? Yeah, so, so we, um, we haven't strictly in open facts yet done this because uh, we haven't yet launched the platform. So we're aiming for around about November when the first version of this will be on the internet that people can use. Um, but what we have done within the ChemSpider group is been looking at some of this uh, through the ChemSpider web interface with chemists. And it's interesting. One of, so um, what, again, what you find is you get you know, a few people who do a lot and then a very large amount of people who do the odd thing when they see it and stuff. And actually the barrier seems to be that if you make it easy for that long tail to just click and do things, then they will, but if you make it hard, they won't. Um, but another data set we've got is, uh, is around the, um, oh, I can't remember the name of that, the universe galaxy classification um, thing that, that I think you can do on the internet where you know you go there and you sort of describe a galaxy as egg shaped or round or whatever. We actually have a version of that for chemistry where people have gone and um, said that this molecule might be incorrect or whatever and trying to catch things that some of the rules uh, miss. So we have a mass, an absolute mass of this data just sitting in a database and so you're not kind of relying on one person, you can build up a profile that a lot of people have said that this is, it, this is an error. And, and so the Royal Society of Chemistry is sitting on that data and don't really know how to get it out because they want to get out in a way that you know, credits the people who are involved uh, in, in a way, and puts it in a way that isn't sort of saying it's absolute truth but is, is the prediction. So they're planning to actually release all that as nano publications through Open Facts as well. So, you know, we, um, well, I think we understand the, you know, the, the crowdsourcing is, is tricky but I think putting some, you know, some good tools and also user focused tools. I mean, this chemistry thing was directed at chemists to do with the way chemists like. So I think you know, making really good usability tools is the, is the way to go. Um, <laughs> You're not loud. Yeah, because there is almost a philosophical implication of what you were doing with equality, right? So, so in our works, it's very naive to say less, right? And two things are the same or they're not, and that's the end of it. And everybody agrees that this is too simplistic. Uh, so it depends on who you are, whether they are the same or not. But in what you're, and what people do is they, they compute different same as sets. But you are going one step further, namely, you are, you are saying we can't even decide up front no. whether two things are different under certain circumstances. We have to do it at query time, depending on who you are and what you ask. I mean, so, yeah, but, yeah. so that seems a very almost a philosophical implication about that whether things are equal or not depends not only on what they are, but also who's asking and what they're asking for. I, I, I mean, I totally agree. I think that the, the problem that we face is the, the differences between, so, you know, the differences between ChemSpider and Gleevec, uh, and Drug Bank for Gleevec, for example, it can be due to a fundamental difference in the science, or it can just be down to a different interpretation by a human being. And you can't separate those out. You know, we, we, you know, we just have no way of doing it. So we need a mechanism that, you know, we still can't cope with the fact that some are going to be right and some are going to be wrong. What we can do is let the user decide on the fly what they, what they, what they want to do. And I, th I think for us, we, you know, if, again, uh, we're building all this stuff. If you don't like the way that we're doing it, actually one thing we are doing is releasing all of these relationships into the public domain. So if someone else was to come along and say, no, I think he's talking rubbish, I think the better way to do it is this, We'd love to see it because I think you know the the, the 
Yeah, and they can do this, you know, using different technology. So, so one of the things I think we're contributing is, uh, this is why I still see OPS 1.0 as kind of a stat, you know, a flag to say we should look at things like this. I think OPS t Open Facts 2 is probably the thing that's going to do all the very, very fancy, cool stuff. But we need to, you know, we need to get this, essentially, the, you know, the pro version 1 prototype of a system in this space out to show the intent of what we want to do. And we've debated many times, you know, how to exactly represent this data. You know, I kind of, um, you know, I actually, you know, kind of didn't represent faithfully some of these links, right? Because some of them are database to database. Some of them are database to intermediate to database, you know? And, and so there's a lot of modeling that we're still yet to really work out to exactly how we need to re represent these, these relationships. But, you know, I think, I, I think, yeah, we, in this project, we need to try it because, you know, chemists, when they look at a system and it just makes a judgment either way and it's wrong, they just switch it off. Yeah, but there seems to be nothing special about chemistry. No, well, yeah. I think that's where I was going. In chemistry, but this is one of the two things that people don't depend on who you are, who's asking, and what you're asking me for. Yeah. Um, I try to think of some non chemistry, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I'd love to, again, you know, I am, I am not an ontologist, and I'd love to, you know, hear theories on, you know, where, where else this could go, because I think, you know, and, 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 you know, again, scores, you know, whether you say MAS or scores exact match or whatever is, is irrelevant, it's, I think there's always this, there's the kind of thesaurus relationship, and then there's the, science, the contextual, the actual domain-specific relationship between these things. And we, again, we're still, you know, f uh, changing our ideas on exactly how we implement this. But I think the fundamental philosophy is, as you say, I think we need to look at much more where the user can say, you know, okay, this is part of this, but for all intents and purposes, they're the same thing. So just treat them the same for this query, but don't for another. Thanks. Thanks.